Hello, good evening, and welcome to Practical Christianity Bible Study. My name is Tunde Disu, and you are very welcome to this program tonight. Tonight we're looking at a topic, love your neighbor. We're looking at love your neighbor as a topic of our discussion tonight. Love your neighbor. The truth is we all have neighbors. We have neighbors, and our commandment, the commandment from God to all of us is to love our neighbors, is to love one another, is to love our neighbors. But I want to start by asking a question. Have you ever asked God a question? Not because you want the answer, not because you don't know the answer, just because you want to test God. You want to see whether God really can. Especially when people are going through hardship or, or difficulties or challenges, it is very, very common to ask God, are you real? Are you actually there? Are you, are you as powerful as you, as you claim to be? Why am I going through this? Why am I facing this? Now, there are others who will ask God questions not because they are going through hardship, just because they want to, quote and unquote, catch God unaware. But you see, you and I know that God is the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the, the, the creator of heaven and the earth. And so there is nothing hidden before him. So to, in, on today's program, as we look at this topic of love your neighbor, we're going to be looking at some key, key situations and key instances in the world where people try to catch God on our way, all in the name of trying to, uh, to trick God. But God, being who he is, showed them who is God. Before we start, let's go into a short word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for another day, another week, another month, another year. Thank you for this moment that we have to spend with you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and the freedom to be able to proclaim your name and your gospel freely without any hindrances, without any inhibition. Without fear, thank you for the privilege to be called your children. Thank you for the privilege to sit at your feet. Thank you for the privilege to feed from your word. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that guides and leads us in all that we do. We commit today's program into your hand. We ask you, O Lord, by your spirit to lead, guide, and direct all the affairs of today. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear. Open our minds to receive the word that it may bring forth fruit in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And to you alone be all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful name we have prayed. Amen. So as I was saying, have you ever asked God a question? Not because you want an answer, but because you want to test him. Because this program today, we're going to see some people who try to do that with God and the result thereof. For instance, if you look in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of, of Luke in chapter 10 precisely, the Pharisees came to Jesus and they were asking Jesus whether it is lawful for them to pay tax or not. They were asking Jesus, is it lawful for us to pay tax or not? Now, you will understand that this is something they've been doing up to that point. They have never shown any resistance, any, 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 any objection to paying tax. But now they want to ask Jesus, should we pay tax? Should we actually be paying tax to, to the government? Well, you know the story. The result or the answer that Jesus gave them was uh, he, he left them dumbfounded with his response. As if that was not enough, then the Pharisees came. I mean, sorry, the Sadducees came. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they're always working hand in hand. So after the Pharisees have done their bit, the Sadducees then came and said, Master, they told him about the story of a woman who is married five brothers. Uh, or seven brothers, and they said, 
at resurrection, whose wife will she be? And again, when Jesus gave them an answer, uh, they had to cover their faces in shame. But then the Bible says something. It said, but then come this certain man. In fact, let us read that passage. Luke chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 25. Luke 10 from verse 25. Luke 10, 25. It says 10, 25. Because this is very important for us to see it as it is written in the word. Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Immediately we, had, we identify the motive behind this man's action. His main reason is to tempt Jesus. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, on the surface, you, you, you will agree with me, that was a valid question. It's a life-changing, life-defining moment to ask that question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? This man is not just consumed by this question with his status here on earth. He's thinking, where do I go? What will happen to me after this life has finished? Where will I go to spend my eternity? Which is a question that every human being must answer, must have an answer to. What can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto he said unto him, What is written in the law? Remember, as at this time, people were living under the law. So Jesus said to him, What does your law say? What is the commandment that the, the law of God has given concerning? This question you're asking. In order for me to identify where you are. And he said. And he answering said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And with all thy soul. And with all thy strength. And with all thy mind. And thy neighbor as thyself. You will love the Lord with all your strength with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. This do, and thou shalt live. You see, there's nothing wrong in asking God, question. In fact, it is a good thing for you to seek wisdom from God. He said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. So it is a good thing to ask God questions when you are not sure, when you don't know, when you need counsel, when you need wisdom. But make sure the question you are asking God is for you to gain understanding. It's for you to gain knowledge. It's for you to gain clarity. And not just to tempt him. So, in verse 27, Luke 10, 27. Jesus said, the man said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbors, and thy neighbor as yourself. You see, Man's relationship with God in the beginning, in the beginning of time, the relationship between man and God is governed by the Ten Commandments as was given to Moses. 
in Exodus chapter 20 from verse 1 to 17. The Ten Commandments as was given to Moses was what is guide what the, the what governed the relationship between man and God. But when Jesus came, Jesus summed up all these Ten Commandments and all the other laws and bylaws. He brought them down, he summed them up, he, he, he bunched them together, he narrowed it down to these two laws, to these two commandments. He said, you will love the Lord your God with everything and you will love your neighbor. On these two hangs all the law and the prophets. In Matthew 22 verse 40, these two, love the Lord and love your neighbor, was the summation of all the laws and the prophet. But the operative word, the, this, the, the, the key of all these things in, in these two laws is summed up in one word, all, all, A-L-L, -L, all. You see, Christians, you are very good at professing, I love the Lord. We raise our hands, I believe in God. Oh, I surrender all. I give you all. I am all of you. You have all of me. But is that just something we say or something we are? Is that something we say or something we do? Is that something we confess or something that we practice? You see, until you submit all. Let me put it this way. How much of your heart have you given to God? You see, some people have, they have God, they have Jesus as their Savior, but they, don't, they, they have not received Him. They have not established a relationship with Him as the Lord of their life. Which, how much of your heart have you actually given to God? Which part of your life, of your body, of your existence, have you marked no-go area as far as God is concerned? You can have this, you can talk about that, you can touch this, you can correct me on this, but this particular one is a no-go area. Now, you may say, no, that's not true, I, I, that's not me. Well, God bless you. But the reality is when you look at your life and my life, when we look at how we carry ourselves, how we portray, what we do, how we do, you will find that there are some aspects of your life that you have not surrendered completely to God. Thank God, God, God in his wisdom said, after we become born again, the next step is to renew our minds by the word. See, this renewal of our mind is part of the process. It's actually the process of surrendering every bit and every part of our lives unto God. So which part of your body, which part of your life have you marked as a no-go area for God? What about your soul? Have you com 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 compartmentalized your soul in such a way that there are certain areas that are reserved for your for your for your own pleasure are you honoring god with all of your body is your mind only renewed in certain areas and religion and tradition have occupied the other areas of your life how much of this all have you given because that verse says thou shalt love the lord thy god with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength and with all your mind. You see, until you, until you are in a position where you have fulfilled that, you will always struggle when it comes to the other part of the law, the second part of the law, which says, love your neighbor even as you love yourself. I will go as far as to say some people don't actually love themselves. And that becomes a challenge because you can only love your neighbor as far as to the degree, to the depth and the, 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 the magnitude of how much you love yourself. But what if you don't love yourself? 
What chance have has your neighbor? You see, until we give everything, until we surrender everything, until we, we hold nothing back, we reserve nothing, we have no limitations or inhibition for, our, for God in our lives. We may never even come into the fullness of his provision for us. We may never experience him in his totality. We may never come into the... To the we, we, would, we may never, in fact, I would say we will never enjoy the total package of salvation. What is included, what is embedded, what is, what is packaged as our inheritance, we will not come into it for as long as we have these areas where we hold back, where we limit God, where we restrict God from touching or accessing in our lives. But let's go back to the passage where the, the lawyer is asking Jesus, he said, what do I do? What can I do? How do I go about ensuring my eternity? The main question that this lawyer is asking is not about what to do. His main focus is on eternity. His main mindset is heaven. What do I need to do to translate from where I am now to heaven was his question. But he came with a mindset to tempt Jesus. To, to catch Jesus on our way. To expose that this man is not all that he claims to be. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody that knows better, somebody that should have a better understanding, is trying to, 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 to cut your, your feet off, your, off, off you from underneath you? This is what this man is, is, coming, is trying to do. Even though his question is very genuine. He wanted to know what to do to inherit eternal life. But you see, what I like about this passage is this. Jesus, being the all-knowing God, already knows his heart, can see where this man is coming from. And Jesus answered them, answered him. In the, in, you would think he, he gave him the answer to his question, but Jesus gave him the answer to the level, to the, to the extent of his mindset. He said, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, when you do what the law says, you will live. I need you to hear that. This man is asking, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? To live in heaven for eternity. And Jesus said, if you continue the path that you have established, if you follow this law, that is been that has been handed over to you your your the, the the summation the end result is that you will live this man is not asking about what what do i need to what do i need to do to live he's asking about what do i need to do to inherit eternal life you see your mind your heart god searches the heart of man god knows what is going on in your heart he, he made you, he made you, he molded you, he formed you. So he, he sees your heart. So when this man is coming to say, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And knowing his heart, Jesus said, if you go along this path, you will live. He said, thou hast answered right. This do and thou shall live. This man is asking for, he's seeking for the pathway to eternal life. And Jesus is telling him what he, he that whatever you are doing, continue doing it because it will, it, will, it will give you life, not the eternal life. This man was looking for life in eternity, in heaven. But Jesus is saying the qualities of what you are, the, 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 your current situation, Living by the law that you know can only give you an existence here on earth. You can live, but eternity 
it's a different ball game entirely. Isn't it amazing how many people in this world today will say, oh, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I don't think evil of anybody. Therefore, I'm going to heaven. This is exactly the situation this man is. The, 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 the reality is, however good your do's are, however wonderful your acts are, however glorious and generous and, and whatever it is that you do, it will still not qualify you to live in heaven. The only pathway, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Not by what you do. Not by your, 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 your philanthropic uh, 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 generosity and your giving and your being a good friend and a good husband or a good wife. All of that will not give you eternity in heaven. It is a, a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus that will guarantee that you live in heaven. You see, when you go back to, to that verse, when he said you will love the Lord and with all your heart, with all your soul, with, it wasn't even a suggestion. It was not an opinion. Remember, Jesus asked, what does your law say? It is a law that has been given. It is a commandment. It is not a recommendation. What does that tell us? Because it is a commandment, because, because it is a law established, it means every one of us will have the ability to obey the law, to do what it says. God is not unjust. He will not ask you to do what you are not capable of doing. God will not ask you to deliver what he has not given you. The fact that he gave it as a commandment, the fact that it was a law enacted by him says, already in you and I we have what it takes, we can deliver, we can obey it, we can carry it out. We have, you and I, we have the power and the ability to control our heart, our mind, our soul, and our body. If we're not able, God won't ask us to do it. He's not unjust. But most of life challenges, most of the issues that we deal with in life, most of the things that we contend with, most of the things that we struggle with in life, if you trace it deep far enough, you would locate the reason is because we have not given that part of us. We have not surrendered that arena of our lives, that that's, that that compartment of our being has not been given to God. You see, until you yield everything to him. Jesus says, said, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. Why will he say, cast your cares upon me if he cannot do anything about it? But because he, he understands your limitations, he knows your ability, and what you are confronting, what you are dealing with is bigger, is stronger, than he, what you can handle. He said, don't worry about it. Just give it to me. But you see, because we have not released ourselves in the first place, we struggle with casting our cares upon him. So whatever challenge you're facing, whether in your marriage, whether in your career, whether in your business, whether in your family, whether in your health, whether whatever challenge you're facing, before you start knocking on the door of heaven, look on the inside and ask yourself, have I surrendered this part of me to God? Until we pour, all, until we pour it all out, until we surrender it all out, there will be no change or advancement. We will continue to, to, to just keep trying and keep going and keep trying and keep going and keep trying. But that trying is not the answer. It's the submission of all. What you are holding back on in your life today and expecting an outstanding result from, you will not get it because you're still holding it. You have to give it all. You have to surrender it. You have to deliver it and release it 
And now God will take care of it. So, Jesus answered this man. He said, you've done well. You have answered correctly. You go and do this, and then you will live. But the second part of this law is something that you and I, we, 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 we have the ability to, to take care of. The first part, which is love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul. Yes, we have the ability. But the second part is even more real, more in your face and in my face than even the first part. Because the first part, is you can say to us, I love the Lord with everything. i given everything. I've surrendered my life to God. We will take you at your word. But when it comes to the second part, which says, and love your neighbor as yourself, it's a practical, demonstrative action that we all can see. Not because we are judgmental, not because we want to judge you, but because it has to be real. You see, unless there's something fundamentally wrong with a human being, every human being, every one of us, Every man, woman, boy, or girl, they love themselves. Unless there is a fundamental problem with that person. If there isn't, oh boy, we love ourselves. We take care of ourselves. We look after our body. We, we do whatever it takes, whatever is necessary, whatever is needed, whatever is required to look after ourselves. Because why? We love ourselves. And the, the, the second part of it is saying, do same to your neighbor. You see, even, the fact is, if you don't love yourself, if for any reason you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. Because you can only give what you have. Unfortunately, most of us in this world, we are selfish. We are selfish. We are selfish by nature. We are selfish by birth. We are selfish in our, in, our, in our opinions. We are selfish in our attitude, in our mindset, in everything we do. We are selfish. We think first of the three us, the three in one. We are like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We have our own, our own trinity, me, myself, and I. That is, that is the, the first and the most prominent focus in our lives. Now, there's nothing wrong in you loving yourself. As long as that love is radiating, is being dispersed, is being given out freely to the degree to which you love yourself. God is not saying you shouldn't love yourself. But he's saying the commandment is to extend that same love, that same level of love, extend it to somebody else. You don't love yourself because you expect something back from yourself. You don't take care of yourself because you expect something back from yourself. You don't feed yourself because you're expecting back something back from yourself. You don't extend the grace and the, and the, sec, and, and the benefit of the doubts to yourself because you expect something back from yourself. And God is saying, do same to your neighbor. Do the same to your neighbor. You don't judge yourself by your actions. You judge yourself by your intentions. Then give your neighbor the same benefit of the doubt. You allow yourself. I allow myself. We all allow ourselves to learn from our mistakes and move on. And, ex and all we need to do is to extend the same grace. To our neighbor. <sighs> Jesus said to this guy. To this lawyer. This do. And thou shalt live. This do. Do what? Give all to God. Love others like you love yourself. If you keep your life. You will lose it. But if you give your life, you will find it. 
that's even what Jesus said. I wrote in, 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 my, in my book, Elisha Project, The Privilege of Serving Leaders. Elisha Project, The Privilege of Serving Leaders. I wrote in that book, I said, one of the greatest key to curing and demolishing and completely destroying selfishness is to serve. You cannot serve God and serve man and not love them. It has to come from the heart of love. Unless you are doing eye service. If it's a genuine, true love from your heart, you have to give it. You have to give it. And whatever you give, what, whenever you give all of yourself, whatever you give of, out of yourself, they have a way of coming back to you in abundance. You see, the seed, again in my book, I said the seed is always smaller than the harvest. There is no way this, the harvest will be smaller than the seed. And that is one of the things that we're missing when it comes to loving and serving. Whatever you give is a tiny bit of all that you have. Whenever you serve, whenever you surrender, whenever you, 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 you do it for others, you are only giving a, a, a very minute bit of yourself. But guess what? The harvest is coming. And when it comes, you will have not enough room to contain it. And that is why the Bible says in Matthew 6.33, it said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Seek first, give to God and to his kingdom. Give to God and to his people. Serve the Lord and his people. Bless the Lord and his people. And all, oh, everything else that you may need, that you may want, that you may desire, that you may long for, they will be added to you cheaply. When you give all, when you give your all to your marriage, to your family, to your friends, to your relationship, guess what? They will also give back to you in abundance. Life is a product. Life is lived on sowing and reaping. And the seed will always be smaller than the harvest. Look in, 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 in the gospel of Luke 10, 29, he said, but he willing, now look at this man. You know, we said at the beginning, his mindset, his main purpose was not just to, wasn't to ask the question, to get an answer, to get an understanding, to get wisdom, to get, to be enriched in, in his intellect. No, his purpose, the reason he wanted, he was asking that question was to tempt Jesus. Maybe we should read that part, that part again. Uh, where is it? He said, no, not that one. Sorry. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Now, you see why he's doing it? He was tempting Jesus. So, after Jesus had now answered him to say, what does the law say? He said, the law says, do this, do that. Jesus said, go and do that and you will live. Look at what this guy did. Remember, this man is a lawyer. But in verse 29, the Bible says, but he, who is he? The lawyer. But the lawyer, willing to justify himself, willing to prove his knowledge, Still continuing on this path of trying to tempt Jesus. This man said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, don't blame this guy. Remember he's a lawyer. What do, what do lawyers, what is their, their tool in trade? What do they do? They use cross-examination to get answers from people. They use questions to get facts out of people. They are skilled in disguising their intent by using questions to get people to tell them and confess and release things they probably don't want to say. So this man is just practicing his, 
his 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 lawyer skill on Jesus when he said, "Okay, I've heard what you said, Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor?" This man is looking for justification. He wants a justification. But look at how Jesus answered him. One of the one of the things I enjoy every time I I read the gospel of of the four gospels any of them, and you see Jesus really want to to make a case to to give to really break it down to people. He won't just answer them. He will tell them a story. He will give them a parable, something they can relate to, something around about them, something they can they can really. Hear not in their ears, but in their heart. So when this man turned around to Jesus and said, Okay, I've heard what you said, but who is my neighbor? Jesus could have pointed to any of the people around to say, This is your neighbor, that's your neighbor, that's your neighbor. But what did Jesus do? In Luke 10, 30 to 37, you know the story. We generally call it the parable of the good Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him for, for dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he saw, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him into an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pens and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. That was the story. Jesus then asked, because this man wants to know who the, his neighbor is, Jesus then asked this man, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the man answered, the lawyer answered, and he said, He that showed, that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. And this is the, the crux of our topic tonight. Love your neighbor. This certain man, we don't even know his name. He was the, the title, his identity was a certain man. He left Jerusalem and he went down to Jericho. He fell among thieves. They stripped him of his raiment. They wounded him and left him for dead. Isn't that just what the Bible says in John 10.10? 10? That the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy? They, they stripped this man. They stole from him. They destroyed him. They broke his, his flesh. They, 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 they wounded him. And they nearly killed him. They left him for dead. You see, the thief will always come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But that... Let's... I'm trying to focus on this... Now, let's look at these three, these three options, the, the, the three possibilities that this man is exposed to, to have somebody to identify his neighbor. There were three chances for him to identify his neighbor. Now, the first chance he had, he was down on the floor, bleeding, wounded, in pain, in distress. His raiment has been taken, his money has been taken, he's left for dead, he's wounded, he can't help himself. 
and suddenly he heard footsteps coming and he opened his half blooded eye and he saw a priest coming Remember, this man is coming from Jerusalem, going to Jericho. There is a high probability that this man is a Jew who's gone to Jerusalem to worship and is going back to Jericho when this happened to him. So he opened his eyes, his eyes and he saw a priest coming. And what does that say to him? Here is a man of God. A priest is God's representative here on earth. So to this man, seeing a priest coming, and secondly, seeing that the priest is also a Jew, just like himself, in his heart, he was singing, Hallelujah. Here comes salvation. Here comes my help. Here comes my deliverance. Here comes my neighbor. But what, did, what happened? The priest... Saw this man in his position, in his situation, and he passed by on the other side. Now, before we start judging this priest, maybe you and I should examine our lives. Have we done the same? Have you done the same? Have you been in the in the in the place of this priest? Have I Walk in the shoes of this priest where you see somebody in their need of your help, of your support, somebody in pain and in distress, somebody that you can, all you need to do is just to put your arms around. Maybe you just need to smile. Maybe you need to, 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 to put your hand in your pocket and be a blessing. Maybe you just need to release a word of comfort. But what did we do? We pass on the other side. And the, 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 the worst part of it is, here is a priest, God's representative. If the people that you and I see, if the people that we regard as God's people, the man of God, the woman of God, if by their actions and their attitudes and their, 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 their words and, 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 and views, if they are not representing God, the way we know God, the way we expect God to, to do. How can they convince this world? How can we convince this world that our God is a loving Father, is a caring Father, is a compassionate Father, when the world can see that even amongst ourselves, we don't express the same thing? Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, you and I are probably the only God some people will see, ever see. Your colleague in the office, your friend, your family, your next door neighbor. Maybe you will be the only Jesus that they will ever see or meet. What will be their long-lasting impression of God through you? How would they rate, how would they judge, how would they feel about God if you are the only representative of God they will ever meet. God is love. And so we're expected to show love. To love our neighbors as ourselves. Maybe it could just be that this priest who passed on the other side, who walked past this man as if he was not there. Maybe the priest was busy he was in a hurry trying to get to church so that he can go and preach the word of God to God's people. And yet, he was too busy doing the work of the Lord and left the Lord of the word, of the work unattended. How many times have we all walked past people? You, even today. Me, even today, on this particular day. How many people have we all walked past without expressing the love of God? How many people have we seen from afar and we know the right thing to do, but we judge them? Oh, if you give him your money, he's going to go and use it for drugs. If you say hello to him, he will just 
continue to talk to you for the next two hours. You'll be late for your appointment. If you stop by, he won't let you go. If you say hi, she won't release you on time. How many times have we done that today on this particular day? How many people have we walked past without seeing them with the eyes of God, without seeing them with the love of God, and we have failed to express the love of God to them because we're very busy. We need to get to the, uh, to the choir practice or to the prayer meeting or to the midweek service and, and the Sunday service. On our way to church, we walk past on the other side. How many times have we left our household, our family, our parents, our children, our neighbors, our in-laws? How many times have we left them hungry, left them in distress, and yet our pockets are loaded with money that we want to go and sow to the church, to the pastor, to the prophet, to the priest? How many times have we said, oh, I don't have any money on me, and yet we have it. I don't have any love to give, and yet we are the embodiment of God who is love. Oh, I don't have time, and yet time is in our hands. We're just not using it. We're not expressing it. We're not giving it. We're not sharing it. We're not loving our neighbors as ourselves. Question, how are you demonstrating the love that you profess for God towards the people of God? 1 John 4, 7 to 11. 1 John 4, 7 to 11 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into this world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. You know the opposite of love? Hate. The opposite of love is hate. What is hate? Hate is defined as the, the feeling, an intense feeling of dislike. An intense feeling of dislike. Hate simply means to loathe to detest, to dislike greatly, to despise, to feel aversion towards, to feel revulsion towards, to feel hostile towards, to be repelled, to be revolted by, to regard with disgust, not be able to bear or stand, be unable to stomach, to find intolerable, to, to recoil from, to shrink from. That is hate. So every time you and I are not displaying the love of God, we have by default switched to hate. Maybe if we, if we start to look at love from that point of view, if we start to, to examine, to appreciate the definition of love from the opposite of love, which is hate, Maybe it will help us to have a better understanding of what God is saying when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. So when you don't love, when you don't show love, when you don't act in love, you have chosen to hate. First John 4, 20 said, if a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he had seen, how can he love God whom he had not seen? Luke 10, 32 says, And likewise a Levite, uh-oh, here comes a Levite. So we've established that the priests walk on the other side. 
Now the Levite came when he was at the place. At what which place? When he was at the place where this man was lying down, bleeding in pain and in distress. The Levite came, looked on him, and passed back on the other side. Wow. Remember, this man is coming from Jerusalem. There's a high probability that this man is a Jew. The Levite is, is a tribe of the children of Israel who are the law keepers. They're the ones that keep the law of God. If anybody should know about love according to the law of God, the Levite must know it. He should know it. But what did he do? He came. He looked on him. He took the time to look at him and say, mm, Pity you. Why did you walk past this place at this time? Anyway, I've got something else to do. And he walked away on the other side. This Levite didn't just walk away like the priest. No, he stopped. He looked on him. He thought about it. He considered the situation that this man was. And religiously, he did nothing about it. This man looked at him. He saw this man bleeding. His clothes being ripped apart. His belongings has been taken away. He is left for dead, for dead. And he had to go and do something more important. And he walked away. I don't know which is more painful. The fact that this man has been beaten all and left for, for dead, stripped of his belongings, the pain, the bleeding, the physical pain he was feeling, or is it the, the pain of knowing that the priest could have helped, he didn't help. The Levite could have helped, he didn't help. Which one is more painful? Have you ever, have you ever been in a situation where people looked at you they know your situation they understand your predicament they appreciate the fact that you are in pain they can see the sorrow in your face but they did nothing about it how did you feel about that isn't that just like our churches today isn't that just like our bible believing pastors and leaders today they can see that you are in serious pain with your health. You are challenged. Your landlord has just thrown you out of the house. You and your family are on the street. Your car has just been repossessed. Your spouse has just been diagnosed with terminal disease. Your, your children are, are just been released from, from, from detention. Everything is happening around you. You've just lost your job. Maybe something terrible just happened. And you go to your church, you go to your pastor, you go to your prophet and your bishop and your geo and your bill and your every other one of them. Guys, please, I need help. I need help. Nine times out of ten, what you will hear from your pastor is, ah, may God bless you. We'll be praying for you. You need to exercise your faith. You need to really stand and having done all to stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Or they might even advise you to sow a quick turnaround seed so that the situation can quickly turn around. Those are the Levites in our midst today, ladies and gentlemen. But look what happened. Look what happened. Remember, the idea is for us to identify which of these three is this man's neighbor. We've seen the priests, we've seen the Levites. And now here comes the third person. This man started hearing another footstep. He opened his eyes and what he saw was not what he expected was the last person that he was expecting or he would rather not see the person he saw was a samaritan now if you understand the rivalry 
between the Jews and the Samaritans. That man, that, that the man on the floor would have rad, could could have said, "I would rather die than to let a Samaritan help me." But here comes a Samaritan. Luke ten, thirty three to thirty four. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. It's the, sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it like, like, like just straight ahead. But there are certain things in the Bible that we need to pay attention to. There are certain punctuations that we, we must understand why they are there. Because when you read this passage in the Bible, in Luke chapter 10, if you have your Bible, turn, turn to it. Luke chapter 10 from verse 33. It said, But a certain Samaritan, comma, as he journeyed, comma, came where he was, full colon. In English punctuation, wherever you see full colon, it means there's a series, a sequence, there is a, a subset that is about to be to be listed. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, full colon. And this is these are what happened as soon as this man came to where this 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 guy was lying. And when he saw him. Just like the other two saw him. The first, the next thing is, the first thing was he saw him. He looked at him. He considered his situation. This next thing the Bible says, said he had compassion on him. He had compassion on him. Remember, the Jews and the Samaritans are arch rivals. They don't see eye to eye. But here is a Samaritan looking at a Jew on the floor and he had compassion on him. The next thing, he went to him and bound up his wounds. He poured oil and wine into the wound. He then lifted the man from the ground and put him on his donkey. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. You want to see God? That is God right there. You want to see God in action? That is God right there. If you say, if I confess, that I'm a child of God, that you are a child of God. This is what God expects us to do. This is a demonstration of the love of God. This Samaritan came, just like the other two. He saw this man. He had compassion on him. He went to him. He bound up his wounds. He poured oil to soothe it. He set him on his donkey. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. The same thing the other two could have done, but they, they choose not to. You see, the first component of love is compassion. And when compassion is strong enough, it, it, it moves you to action. It compels you to do something about what you are compassionate about. And the demonstration, the action that you take from that strong compassion is what is called love. The first component of love, the root of love, love comes out of compassionate heart. And when that compassion has enough strength, is strong enough, it will force you to do something. You have to do something about the, the, what you are compassionate about. And the demonstration of that com compassion is what is called love. You see, you cannot love without compassion. 
but you can have compassion and not love. Because until your compassion is followed up with an action, it's not love. The Bible is talking in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He looked at us in our fallen state. He considered our situation that we are all going to hell in a handbasket. He thought about it and he was compassionate. He was, he, his heart was heavy with compassion. But he didn't stop there. He did not just, just end it there. He did something. He, the, the power of that compassion moved him to the point where he said, for you, if it's just for you, I'll pay the price. And he died for you and I. He died to pay for our sins. He died to take our place and gave us his righteousness. He gave us his royalty. He gave us his, 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 his majesty. He clothed us in, in railment of royals. And he took our sins upon himself. To the point that even God could not look at him on the cross. That is the power of, com of, of com compassion. And when that compassion is strong enough, love is the next thing. You see, love is not an option. To love is not an option. It's a command from God. Jesus said, on these two, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. On these two hands, all the other laws and the prophet. God so loved the world, he was moved with compassion. He gave his son. His son so loved the world, he was moved with compassion, he gave his life. What are, you, what are you giving out of compassion to demonstrate your love for your God and for your neighbors? Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, as we have therefore opportunity, let us, good, let us do good unto all men. As we have this opportunity, just like the priest had the opportunity, just like the Levite had the opportunity, and the Samaritan man had the opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. My brother, my sister, I don't know where you're watching from tonight or whenever you watch this program. Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Where is your compassion? Where is your compassion? Demonstrate your compassion by your action. And that action is called love. Loving and giving, they are opportunity like we've just seen in Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. As we have therefore this opportunity, these opportunities are always around us all the time. They are with us every day, every minute, everywhere we go. We have the opportunity to demonstrate, to show love, to show compassion. To demonstrate the goodness of our God. Especially in this world where, where, where people don't believe in anything. But nobody can contend with a true love born out of compassion. Loving is an opportunity to share God and his love for this world and to this world. The question is, will you become a warehouse that just receives the goods and store it? That just receives the goods and store it? 
that just receive the love of God and keep it to yourself? Would you become a warehouse or will you become a distribution center? A distribution center receives the goods and it disperses. It receives the, it receives the goods and it sends it to where it needs to go, to the different parts of, 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 the, of the world where it needs to go. Are you a warehouse or are you a distribution center? Oh, wow, our time is up. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no choice. It is not open for debate. We have to, we must love one another. And the demonstration of that is what will change this world. Is what will reach this world. Is what will touch this world. Is what will give this world an alternative, a, a sense of there is another way. But it starts with you giving all to God, everything. It starts with you loving yourself. It starts with you loving your neighbor. Maybe you are watching this program, wherever you are watching it, whenever you are watching it, and you are asking the question, how do I give all to God? How do I surrender all to God? What do I have to do? Like this, this lawyer was asking Jesus, what do I need to do to have eternal life? What is this heaven that you are talking about? How can I get to there? How can I be assured that I will live in heaven? What is the guarantee? What is this way, the truth and the life you are talking about? Tell me more about this love of God that you are describing on this program. This love can be yours even right now. All it takes is for you to ask for it. All it takes for you is to open your heart. All it takes is for you to open your mind and your mouth. The Bible talks about with your mouth you will confess. And with your heart you will believe. And when those two are combined, salvation is guaranteed. Eternity in heaven is assured. So if you are watching this program and you don't have that personal relationship with God, you have never one day asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, into your heart, and be your Lord and Savior. You have never experienced this unconditional love, this depth of love that we're, we're talking about tonight. This is your receiving day. This is your opportunity. To receive this love. And all it requires. All you have to do. Is, is a simple word of prayer. And I want you. To give me the opportunity. I would love for you to allow me. Introduce you. To my God. The God that loves you. More than you can ever know. More than you can ever think. He loves you. To the point he gave his life for, for, for in ransom for yours. His name is Jesus Christ. So tonight, if you would like to, if you, if I would like to implore you to welcome this, this Lord into your heart. All I ask for you to do is to say this simple prayer with me. Just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus I come to you tonight. I confess that I'm a sinner. I've tried everything else. None of them has worked. But I've heard about you being the love and your compassion and your plan and your purpose for me. I have heard tonight on this program about the eternity with you in heaven. I want to experience it. I ask you therefore to forgive me of all my sins. 
I confess every sin known and unknown to me. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Wash me clean with your blood. Come into my heart tonight. Rule and reign in my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. And I promise I will follow you all the days of my life. I thank you because I know my sins are forgiven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And I am heavenly bound. I am heaven bound because I am born again. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, my brother, my sister, if you have just said that prayer, if you have just repeated those, that, those words after me, if you have confessed him and you have asked him to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior, you have just made the best decision you can ever make in your life. And I mean that sincerely. Right now, there's a big party that is going on in heaven with your name on the banner because of this decision you've just made. I want to be beside you. I want to walk with you. I want to, 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 to help you to walk with you on this path of your new beginning of your new life, of your newfound love in God and His Son, Jesus Christ. My email address is practicalcbs, practicalcbs at gmail.com. I want to hear from you. Drop me a line. Let me know you prayed this prayer with me. Let me know you have asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. Let's journey together and see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living. I promise you. You will never regret it. Because he's faithful. Because he's true to his word. Because he is love. Personified. Thank you so much. I look forward to receiving your email. I will put my email again on the timeline after this broadcast. Just in case you missed it when I said it. So that you can drop me a line. And let's enjoy God together. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to be able to share the word of God with you. It is, it is, it, it's an honor. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. And I thank you for it. Until we meet again next week, as we continue to look at this, this, this same topic, because we, we, we've just, we've just, gone through the first few pages there is still much loaded in this issue of love and your neighbor of loving your neighbor as yourself and i can't wait till next week when we when we take the another step towards towards unraveling the whole story i look forward to it thank you so much for your time appreciate you i honor you i ask god of heaven to bless you to keep you to protect and preserve you, to grant you all of your heart desire, to meet you at your point of need, to deliver you from every danger and every attack of the wicked one, so that when we meet again next week, we can all rejoice in his goodness because he loves you and he loves me too. Until next week, this is Tunde Disu. From Practical Christian Bible Studies, saying to you, God bless you, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.